Anupam Chugsadu, thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Christensen. Welcome. Hi, I'm Cheryl Picard. I'm glad you all could make it. Hi, Patty McCoyne. Thank you for coming out tonight. All right, Dr. Mayor Van Murphy. Good evening and welcome. I'd like to begin by introducing Ms. Robertson and thank her for being here to capture our minutes this evening. I'd like to ask the remaining members of the team to introduce themselves to you, beginning with Mr. Brandon. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Nick Brandon, Executive Director of Communications and Marketing. Good evening, Kurt Tiskowitz, Assistant Superintendent for Student Services. Welcome. Hi, I'm Debbie Piaz. I'm the Chief Finance and Operations Officer. Welcome. Good evening, Beth Rail, Chief Academic and Innovation Officer. Thanks for being here. Good evening, Shante Langford, Chief Human Resource Officer. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Liz Vartanian Gibbs, Assistant Superintendent, Student and Family Engagement. All right, and if we could have the first ever co chair of the Board of Education introduce themselves. Uh, hello, my name is Josh Patterson, and I'm a Plymouth sophomore and SVA co chair. Perfect. All right. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to allow uh, one additional board member to introduce themselves. You, you can just introduce yourself. I'm Judy Westra. Thank you for being here tonight. All right. Uh, so first up is uh, action item 240803, adoption of agenda, approval of consent agenda. Mr. President, I move that we consider or we adopt the agenda and approve the consent agenda, action item 240803. Second. All right. Dr. Mayor, can you walk us through? Yes, President Wilson, this evening our consent agenda consists of human resources transactions since our last time together. We have new hires for your consideration, and I know that the HR department under the leadership of Ms. Langford, they've been super busy in hiring champions, so we're looking forward to welcoming them to the district. We also have Lee's resignations and retirements, as well as the approval of minutes from our regular and organizational meeting on July 11, 2023. All right. Any questions? Right. All in favor say yes. 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 Any, appro any opposed say no. All right. Motion passes 7-0. Uh, we'll have Ms. Langford walk us through new hires. All right. Thank you, President Wilson. All right. So we have many new hires tonight. When I say your name, could you please stand up so that we recognize you? I have Scott Clanton, who, is, who will be a chemistry teacher at Salem. I have Karen Durana. I hope I didn't butcher that. <laughs> 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 who will be a nurse with us <clears throat> and she will be at Bird and Miller. I have Kristen Gunkelman who will be a chemistry teacher at Plymouth. I have Scott Hawkins who will be a music uh, secondary band teacher at West. Catherine Horning who will be an English teacher at Canton. I have Sydney Jacks who will be an elementary classroom teacher at Dodson. Jennifer Just Justrinsky. How did I do? <laughs> How is it pronounced? Justrinsky. Okay. Welcome. Um, you, she will be an elementary classroom teacher at Workman. Jennifer Colbus. Welcome. She will be in special education at Allen. Nellie Waltby. 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 Malt, Malt, Malt B. B. Got it. <laughs> Art um, Secondary at Salem. <laughs> and then we have Nicole Margusian Galindo. <laughs> Close. No cigars. <laughs> How is it pronounced? Okay. Thank you. I always like to get names correct. And, and she will be an English teacher at Canton. Stephanie Metzer. Might not be here this evening. Um, she will be life management and family and consumer science at Plymouth. Nice. Jessica Paxson, uh, elementary classroom teacher at Workman. Lisa Peters, elementary classroom at Tonda. Kelly Voigt, media specialist at East. And then Mackenzie Williams, who will be a speech pathologist at Dotson and Farrand. And then we also have uh, Sharon Kerr. 
must not be here this evening. Um, and she will be our compliance manager for special education. So welcome all of our new hires. So if you will all give me just a few minutes, I'll meet you out in the hallway, and I just have a little special treat here for you. We just need to be a little quiet because I always get too loud when I go out there. Sorry. <laughs> all right. And so for retirements this evening, we have Renee Ray, um, who is an elementary classroom teacher at Hoban. She has been with us uh, since May 25th of 2000, and she will be retiring effective October 27th of 2023. So we wish her well. And then we have Craig Salen Jr., who is a technical coordinator um, in our, at, at our Educational Support Center. He has been with June 24th of 1993 and will be retiring effective September 29th of 2023. So we just want to wish both of them well um, as they head into retirement. <laughs> and then that concludes the HR portion. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next up is board committee reports and action. And first up is the president's report. Just two quick items. Uh, one is committee assignments. So unless there's any uh, objections, I'd like to appoint um, pretty much all the same committee chairs um, to continue their, their work this year. President Wilson, just for the audience that are watching at home and those here, maybe we should just identify who those Please. folks are. So I'm Patrick Kehoe, and I will be the chair of the Finance and Operations Committee. I'm Anupam Chugsidhu, and I am the chair of the Student Performance and Achievement Committee, also known as SPA. Uh, Patty McCoy, and I chair policy, which has now become the second best committee because we're going to have to give student voice and action the number one spot. That's right. That's right. And then currently, uh, currently I'm chairing the Student Voice in Action Committee uh, with heavy support from Vice President uh, Christensen. So, <laughs> and, that's, and, and, and that's from the board perspective. And then, of course, Josh. Josh, you want to just for the, for the audience at home? Hi. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, maybe we could just do 30 seconds on what each committee does. You know, uh, one of the things I, I tell citizens a lot is that if they really want to understand um, how the sausage is made, if they really want to understand how we get to certain decisions, they should attend committee meetings because that's really where the majority of the work takes place. Often at the board meeting is, is where that final work is presented to the board for approval. But if they want to, for instance, F&O and the budget, the budget process is a very long process that, you know, um, receives community feedback and they go over the feedback. It's a very long process. And then we sit through a couple, you know, two, three presentations at the board meeting, but there's hours and hours of discussion that, uh, <laughs> that uh, happens at, at F&O. So if committee member or community members really want to understand how the budget is built, uh, they should attend FNO if they really want to understand how policies are created. Uh, the discussion they should attend policy and and same with SPA. So maybe just thirty seconds on what each committee does. Please. Sure. So finance and operations, as as uh, President Wilson mentioned, is is one of the big things that we do is the budget. But the budget is actually done across all the departments um, in the um, in the administration in the district. So we review some of those presentations. Beforehand, but it's really a collaborative effort that happens across all of the teams. We do review and um, and look at uh, the, the, the the KPIs, key performance indicators for the custodial and the transportation uh, groups that we do, which are our two largest outsourced um, uh, services the district provides, as well as review all capital and um, other purchases that come through the district. So both uh, the bond projects as well as the the other things. And so it's a it's a good committee where we can go deep into all of those purchasing decisions and all of those things that are part of that process. And we ask a lot of questions and sometimes send things back to get uh, refined and, uh, and, and clarified before they come forward to the full board. And so you get myself and the other board members, uh, Ms. Christensen and Ms. Ricard, they get to ask those really detailed questions there so that that it's a really refined presentation before it comes before the full board. Fantastic. Um, student performance and achievement, as it sounds, we look at instructional programs for students that are in alignment with our dynamic plan as well as assessment. 
Uh, we do assessment review of NWEA, um, SAT, PSAT, SAT, all of the assessments that are required by law. Uh, we also do out of country field trips. So a lot of times you'll see the board looking at um, voting on out of country field trips, textbooks, those all get reviewed through SPA. We have in depth discussions about pilot programs. You know, what do they mean? Uh, did student voice, uh, was student voice integrated into that? So anything dealing with instructional programs and assessment goes through us. And Judy Westra is my partner in crime in that committee. Uh, so for policy, um, we create the, we look at the district policies. A lot of them come through a service that they keep track of changes in legislation because we have to make sure that they are current. Um, and currently we are going through all of our <coughs> policies. We started with the student section um, to make sure that they are current, um, cleaning up so that our language is inclusive and it is common throughout. You know, there was a lot of, you know, language from, you know, 30 years ago uh, where they assumed the superintendent would always be a man. And so we wanted to get rid of that. And um, it's a little more interactive of a committee because if people attend it, we do allow, you know, additional questions and comments during the committee meeting. Um, because what you see is a first read or then a second read, and that's usually after months of review. Um, and Ms. Sadu is also on the committee. Um, so we have core members who come in and out depending on what we're reviewing, and then if we need to also leave. And, th and that notion of uh, a more back and forth with uh, both the citizens representatives on the committee as well as those that are attending is kind of prevalent in, in most of the committees that we have. Um, it, it certainly can be a situation where we might need to put a more structured process, but it's really been very collaborative in terms of what we've done, just as uh, Ms. McCoyne uh, mentioned. Fantastic. All right. Um, and then all uh, board members will serve on the exact same, same committee. So Member Picard is on FNO committee, and as I mentioned earlier, Vice President Christensen is uh, on the uh, Student Voice in Action Committee. Josh, can you talk about SVA? So SVA's goal is to bring all these fabulous people up here, uh, in, like combined with the students. So they're trying to get student voice into what the board is doing, and then we're also working through other students. Uh, to get in their voices as well and then create action which is positive that, that has impact. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and then maybe uh, another point of clarification also is that we also have staff liaisons for each committee so maybe we can identify the staff liaison. All right, why don't we go with you starting with Dr. Good evening, I'm on student voice in action. I am on policy. Student performance and achievement. I'm on the uh, finance and operations mm -hmm. subcommittee. And I'm in limbo right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ad hoc committees. <laughs> and I'm a member of the Plymouth Kent Educational Foundation Committee. And actually, I'm also on the Plymouth Educational uh, Foundation Committee as, uh, as the board representative as part of that process. Great. Perfect. So Thanks. once again, just a great example of how uh, administration and board works together on the committees uh, and the board meetings are ultimately the end results of a, a lot of uh, many, many hours of, of work in, uh, in committee. Spoken for me, who's on every committee. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, Dr. Merritt, Dr. Merritt attends every committee, absolutely. Um, all right, so we're set with that. Committee assignments, we're, we're set with that. And then board retreats. So, Upcoming August 14th, we're doing a board retreat uh, Monday. Monday. That's it's right, here. Monday. It's here. Okay. Are we doing it in the room? Yes, we yep. have this room, right? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Um, so we'll have a board retreat. One of the main um, uh, focus areas is focusing on 2023-2024 goals, um, and specifically for uh, superintendent. Uh, that'll be a big focus. Hopefully, uh, we'll have some time to also start to tee up goals for the board. Uh, simultaneously um, but if not we'll set a additional time to be able to do that so any questions on that thank you to everyone who uh, responded to the doodle poll to to get that done all right and that does it for president's report uh, next up is spa 
We generally meet the first Wednesday of every month, but we are going to make an exception for September as the first week is the back to school. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give staff um, and uh, administration time to get adjusted. So our first meeting is September 13th at 5 o'clock in this room. Thank you. Policy. Um, so we will be meeting August 29th, which is three weeks from tonight at 5.30. Um, it's the next board meeting. And it is down in the collaboration space. If you go all the way down this hallway until you can't go any farther, that's where it is. Great. F and L. So the uh, Finance and Operations Committee usually meets on the Thursday before the board meeting. So we typically meet twice a month. So it's one of the most active committees because as you'll see on the agenda this evening, there's a lot of things that come up that get vetted and validated through that committee. So we met last Thursday, August 3rd, and we reviewed the um, upcoming uh, non-homestead ta uh, tax millage renewal and the process that we'll have to do for that. That will likely occur next year as part of that process and will be more feedback for the board as we get proposed ballot language and talk about timelines as part of that process. We also approved the FNO calendar for 2023-2024 and we had a deep dive in some of the big bond projects that are going on, especially the ones at the high school. Um, the new band room addition, the new stadium multipurpose room, a new robotics innovation hub, uh, new tennis courts that need to be considered. And we also had a deep discussion about some of the recent challenges that we've had at Hoban. Um, Hoban is uh, um, one of our elementary schools that scheduled, was originally scheduled for 2024, 25, uh, I'm sorry, 25-26 for uh, renovations and updates as part of our bond project. But Hoban recently had a, um, a flooding event. Basically, the, uh, the outlet pipe from our water retention uh, and collection system uh, is smaller than the volume of water that comes in. And under uh, extraordinary rainstorm situations, we get a backup that can uh, end up flooding the, uh, the facility. And you know, we got some water into the facility. That water has been remediated. We've done, uh, the district has done mold inspections and make sure that there's no problems with that. But we want to make sure that we can address those problems. So we are looking to pull the bond projects forward um, as much as we can as part of that work. You know, there's renovations and, um, and uh, additions that are planned for that school, but there's also work that we're considering doing with respect to stormwater retention. And so we're gonna see if we can both pull the entire project forward as well as uh, see if we can even split the stormwater retention process and uh, media, uh, remediation um, from that work to see if it can be done sooner to address some of those challenges that are happening at Hoban. Uh, we also did a review of the ADA audit. So as, you, as we've talked about here, we've looked at uh, ADA compliance um, as a district for quite a while and how we can address those, those kinds of problems. And one of the things that we considered here is not only meeting the standards of ADA, but going beyond it. You know, the premise of ADA is to make it so that the facilities are accessible. And sometimes you can meet the letter of the law, but it's not actually friendly. You know, the best example of that is where you have um, a button that you have to press to get to a door uh, that allows it to open, but it's on the wrong side of the door. So making sure that you move those things to the right side so that it's, it not only meets the compliance, but it's also easy to use. So the, the district is going to engage with a, uh, a firm, and that will be up on the agenda this evening, to do an, uh, a full audit of every one of our buildings for both uh, compliance with the law as well as best practices for ADA. And lastly, um, well, actually, two more things that we reviewed. We reviewed the radar uh, speed signs that will be up on the agenda this evening, as well as the purchase of playground mulch uh, that will be up <laughs> on the agenda this evening. So good times. <laughs> and I'm sorry, our next meeting is uh, um, tentatively scheduled for Thursday, August 24th at 5 p.m. The reason I say tentative is this is, uh, the first time in a long time that we don't have any agenda items. So it is possible that that meeting might get canceled and we're, we're all <laughs> got our fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, we've talked about that. <laughs> thank you, sir. As always, FNO brings the heat <laughs> every, every board meeting. So the heat's in the FNO meeting, so it isn't here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, student voice in action, two quick updates. One, I know on the agenda it says September uh, 11th is actually the next SVA meeting, but uh, we've decided to push that to uh, September 18th. So we'll make sure that that's reflective everywhere. 
And then also we currently have an RFP. We're accepting uh, um, applications for an RFP for a consultant. This is someone who will work with SVA to really help them craft their agenda, um, help put additional infrastructure in place, and really support uh, the, the students uh, and the students' voice. Uh, Dr. Liz, can you give a little more background on where those who are interested can, sure. can find a link? So if you're interested in um, the SVA consultant position, you can find the link on our district website under HR, and it would be considered a miscellaneous employee. Also, it is with the Wayne Risa um, hiring site, and we have shared it with all the local universities. You can also call the board office, and our receptionist also has access to share that information with you if you'd like to apply to be the SVA consultant. Thank you. Uh, taking applications through September 29th, correct? Right. All right. Make sure you get it in. Don't wait. And with that, we will uh, move on to administrative reports. And first up is Superintendent Dr. Merrick. All right. Thank you, President Wilson. I cannot believe that it is the first week of August. And in just a short month, we will be welcoming our students back for the 23-24 school year. I think the last time we were together, I was bragging about the incredible summer programming that was happening in our buildings this summer. I want to continue to applaud our staff, the majority of our, our internal staff that have taken on these camps and opportunities for learning and enrichment for our students. And it's just been a continued overwhelming success. I want to give a shout out um, to Ms. Rail and her team for really the vision of um, utilizing these federal funds to really expand offerings and opportunities for students and I think that they've been so receptive as well as our staff and just appreciate the good work that's going on also a lot of construction in the community we talked about that at FNO as you heard I have a little heartburn but it, I'm told that we're on track even though it doesn't look like that from the street but a lot of construction and good work going on to so continue to thank our community for our investment in our 2020 bond our students and our staff and our school community really does deserve these enhancements. A few just quick updates for our community. First is the summer communication. Because we're just one short month away from the start of school, we wanna make sure that our families are ready to begin for this start of the school year. We ask that everyone visit our district's website to download or view important documents that will help to make this transition to school much easier for everyone. One, we have our PCCS Summer Communication. This offers a wealth of information district-wide covering topics such as scheduling, nutrition services for school, breakfast and lunch programs. As we know, as a part of this year's budget, that will be free for all families, so you have some more information about that. We're really excited to be able to offer that to our entire school community. We have transportation information, enrollment information for families who are new to the district, and information about the transition from elementary to middle school and to our district's high school options. We also have the PCEP e-communicator, -communica and that contains information for students attending the park this fall. That document covers everything from scheduled pickup to parking, athletics, activities, and so much more. So again, both of these documents, they've been massed, emailed out to all of our families. They're posted on our social media outlets, and of course, they can be found on the district's website. So we wanna encourage you to get the word out, check your emails, and make sure that we're prepared for the start of the school year. A shout out to our robotics team, the world champs. They're gonna have robots in the park. We always love to go and, and see them, so we're inviting the community to join them. This year it is on August the 13th. That is coming up this weekend. Is that right? Yes, yeah, Sunday. Yes, Sunday. Sunday in downtown Plymouth. And they're um, going to introduce students to STEM activities. They'll see guests participate in hands-on tasks, explore FIRST robotics programs, robotics keepsakes, and more. So I'm kind of excited to see what they're going to share. This free program is going to be held again in Kellogg Park, and that's gonna be from 10 to 4 p.m. Finally, save the date, save the date, save the date for the annual Back to School Bash. We wanna invite our entire PCCS community to celebrate the new school year. Uh, Mr. Brandon, I applaud him and his team for a few years ago saying, hey, the start of the school year, we're always talking about celebrating. Well, let's bring our community together and celebrate. And it's been an overwhelming success. This is now our annual tradition. It's filled with games, prizes, food, fun, and just fellowship. So all that our information that our families need about the exciting things happening in our district. This year, we're going to return to the bus loop at Salem. 
and this gives really an opportunity for our families to have tours of the building at our campus. We know that that campus is so large and can be intimidating mostly to our adults. The kids adjust, but that really opens up our doors early and you have an opportunity to learn about our exciting offerings and take a tour of the building. The BASH once again will feature PCEF's Fun Zone. And this is an area that really went over well last year with our students. They have a petting zoo, um, fun games and features. This is the Plymouth Kent Educational Foundation, which is putting this on, and they provide such incredible support to our students through classroom grants and other competitions. Why can I talk? <laughs> A lot going on. So this bash, it's completely free to attend, so we encourage everyone to come out and celebrate the start of the school year. It's going to be held from 11 to 2 on Saturday, August the 26th, and we can't wait to see you there. And that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. Uh, next up, communication and marketing with Nick Brandon. And good evening, everyone. It's a tremendous pleasure to present to you tonight the PCCS student, staff, and community surveys, an update, and some findings from this work. I'll be joined tonight by two members of our teaching and learning team, Mr. Jonathan Flukes, who will assist in presenting some of the findings from all the surveys, including the family survey, as well as Mr. Anthony Ruella, who's going to walk us through a very important part of the presentation, which is sort of what's next and how we're going to really elevate our survey work in partnership with Panorama to best serve students, staff, and families through this survey work. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining tonight. First and foremost, we would really like to thank our students from the Student Voice and Action Subcommittee which we were um, fortunate enough to be able to vet this presentation through SVA as our board subcommittee. Uh, in utilizing student voice in connection with the dynamic plan, SVA served a, as a tremendous resource for feedback as we vetted the initial draft of this presentation. So Josh, I want to thank you and your SVA colleagues. Uh, your feedback was amazing and certainly made the presentation uh, much better because you, uh, of all the contributions you made. So thank you and thank you SVA. When it comes to this work, it's really easy to align with the dynamic plan in so many different areas. In fact, the, the entire scope of the survey work with Panorama aligns with all five strategic goals of the dynamic plan. When you look at the Panorama student success work, our student surveys, our staff surveys, and of course the recently completed family surveys. A lot of different connections to the dynamic plan, a lot of intentionality behind the work to make sure those connections are strong. So as you can see, multiple connections to all five themes of the dynamic plan. With that, we just want to walk you through what our sort of survey scope and scale looked like during the 2022-23 school year. This is going to set up later when Mr. Rella shares with you what the plan is moving forward for 2023-24 as we look to really synergize and triangulate these three surveys. But you can see it started in the fall. There was SEL competencies work as well as supports and environment surveys continued in the winter where also the staff and teacher survey was administered. In the spring, some of those areas were revisited. And then later in the spring in May is when we debuted our first family school relationship survey in partnership with Panorama. And of course, this is a continuation of the work that we did for six years with K-12 Insight as our partner. So that gives you what it looked like this year. And again, that's a nice setup for what this will look like next year and into the future. As we look at the logic model for this survey work, it's very important when you look at our problem st statement to focus on that we want to make sure that the voice of our students, staff, and families are collected in really important ways, actionable, timely, and customer friendly. One of the things we really looked at this year was how can we make this survey more customer friendly, particularly in the areas of the length of the survey. So we worked really hard with Panorama to make sure the family survey was more concise. It gave families a chance to offer their feedback but not maybe take as much time as they had to give before in our previous incarnations of the survey. And of course, we want to make sure that all this feedback is a vital part of all decisions that are made uh, by the school district and that that voice is found in many different ways. Right now, we're in the short-term outcome goal area. That's why it's outlined in green. We're going to be sharing out the data this evening on the district website in our typical annual practice, the results from our family survey. We want to be transparent with those results and share them out with the community. And of course, there'll be 
a lot of back to school review, some fall goal setting that this uh, survey and data will be used for in collaboration with our principals and our program leaders. In terms of midterm goals, we're going to work to revise the survey, really look at the survey program. That's the information that Mr. Ruel is going to present to you later into this presentation. And we'll also really stay engaged with our principals and program leaders in that midterm to make sure this data is their data and they're using it for their goal setting and their everyday practice in their buildings and programs. In the long term, one of the things we really want to make a goal of next year is to boost participation in the family survey. So we want to put together a longer term communication strategy to make sure that we're not just waiting until um, close in proximity to the survey administration, that we're reminding families that there will be time in the spring to let their voices be heard and have multiple touch points so that we have more of a communication strategy versus just an announcement that says, here, take this. We think that's going to be an important way to boost participation. This is baseline data year one. We've got a number to work from. Our goal is certainly to grow that number next year in terms of participation for our family survey. And then, of course, school improvement planning and an aligned reporting process for these surveys. We want all the surveys to be reported in alignment for the data to be triangulated and for these surveys to really speak to each other as, oppo as opposed to being surveys that sort of stand alone and are independent of each other. That's really important part of this work moving forward. At this point, I'd like to bring up Mr. Jonathan Flukes from our teaching and learning team to go through kind of the scope and scale of the panorama survey work, the topics that are covered, and also the audiences that take the surveys. Mr. Flukes. Thanks for having me again. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on each of these slides. They're kind of self-explanatory, um, but I wanted to kind of, it gives you a good sense of what's um, involved in each of the surveys, the topics, and then which student groups or um, staff groups or what other um, respondents are taking these surveys. Uh, when you have access to the actual document, you can see there's actually links to the real surveys, actual items, um, paper versions of those that, that the students, staff, and families take. So um, what we called the, the SEL surveys. These are the um, 3 through 12. Um, students in grades 3 through 12 take these topics. Um, and then what is also considered the supports and environments uh, survey, um, you can see those topics there. And we'll, we'll get, dig into that and kind of show you all of those together as we, as we share the results. And one uh, thing I've, I've, we've put on these slides is that at the bottom there in the, in the green box, it shows you when we administer currently, at least in the last um, two years, when we administer these surveys. So these are the student surveys um, for the year. Um, here are the teacher perceptions of students at SEL. So students in grades K through 2 don't actually take a survey themselves. It's a, teachers are responding how they perceive these, their student skills. So these are the, the content areas, I'm sorry, the topic areas, as well as a link to the surveys, and then when those are administered during the year. Here are the topics that we ask our staff to respond to throughout the year. These are in the middle and the end of the year. Uh, uh, staff and teachers um, respond to just two topics, um, well-being, belonging, and then there's these additional topics that teachers only uh, respond to in both those time periods. And then here are the topics that we asked our families um, this spring to respond to. Before we get to some of the findings, just to give you a little bit of background of the family survey, again, in December of 2022, we made the decision to shift our family survey work to Panorama. Really, there were three core reasons for this. Number one was a, a very strong existing relationship between our teaching and learning team and Panorama. We were seeing some of the survey work that was going on there, and with some of the goals that we wanted to achieve with the future of our family survey, it seemed like a very, very good fit. When it, we wanted to have a consistent reporting and analytics platform. So now as opposed to having multiple vendors and partners doing this work, it's all under one roof, all under one umbrella, which helps a lot with reporting and analytics, especially as in this evening, to try and draw some comparisons between the work of these multiple surveys. And then of course the company's reputation and reliability, Panorama is a trusted partner. We've had a terrific relationship and experience in, with them so far. We worked together with Panorama designing a survey that uh, both incorporated Panorama's already existing topics and questions. These are able to align to national benchmarks, which is one of the real nice qualities of Panorama. 
is they uh, give you the opportunity to compare yourself against national benchmarks so long as you use their instruments. But we also want to customize the family survey because PCCS is a unique place, as we all know. So we wanted to ask some questions that were really specific. For example, we asked some questions in connection with the dynamic plan uh, as part of the family survey because we thought that was very important. So it was a nice mix of, of custom content along with some of Panorama's exi existing content. Of course, there's a cost savings when you consolidate all your data pl uh, platforms. So by consolidating and not have multiple platforms, we were able to experience a cost savings, which of course we liked. The initial survey ran from May 15th to May 29th. It was available in 23 different languages for accessibility. And once again, the comprehensive report of this year's data will be available on the website this evening at the conclusion of tonight's meeting. That being said, we'll dive into the findings and I'll bring back up Mr. Flukes. All right, now for the, the fun stuff. Um, of course, if there's, you know, if I'm here, I've got to put some sort of cool graph on there. Um, so I want to just talk to you about kind of the, the, how we looked at the data. Um, we're not going to go through every single line of it because that would just be, but we want to like boil down some, some of the key things that we saw from the data as well as how, how both Panorama gives us the results to us and then how we then kind of wrap our heads around it. So respondents are taking items on the survey, but they're also bundled into these topic levels. So we're going to report out mainly the topics um, tonight, but you have access to the actual results also linked at the end of the, the presentation where you can see item by item results. Um, one of the other things that helps us kind of um, collapse the data is um, we take, or a panorama takes the, the responses in the survey, um, the different options uh, that are presented, and they kind of class them into a favorable um, percentage. And so here's an example here of a, of a, of a response option that is um, given to us from the results, and you can see how it's collapsed into the favorable categories, the, the frequently and, and almost all the time. So, so we'll be showing you the percent responding favorably to the topics for the most part. And then also to get kind of a different angle at making sense of the data, we've also got national, a national database from Panorama that gives us kind of our, our um, relationship to the rest of the nation that's taken some of these um, surveys and these topics. And we don't have them for every single topic area and every single survey. You'll see that we have it for the st student, staff, and teacher. Um, but it gives us kind of a different lens to look at the data, not just in terms of percent favorable, but also how are we compared to a national data set. And so, for example, you know, we might come across an item that it might, we might have relatively modest favorable ratings, but that could put us in a high percentile in the national benchmark. So it gives us a different way to kind of look at the data. And you'll see there's a couple of examples, and I'll point them out where that, that occurs. So we're going to talk, so I want to give everyone kind of a, a, a big overview of each of the topic areas. So it's kind of a, a short summary of the different topic areas with um, an example item from that topic. So I'm not going to read through these, um, but I want to, I'll read one just as an example. So um, for the teacher perception survey for students in K2, um, for the emotional regulation topic, um, this really asks us, uh, as teachers, you know, how well students regulate their emotions. And an example item in that survey is, how often are you able to control your emotions when you need to? So this is what a teacher is responding for each of the students in their class. When they look at each student, they, 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 they perceive a um, response and then and select it. So um, this is just kind of an overview of all of those uh, topics for the K2 survey. And then the next slide I'll present the findings um, for each of those topics. And that's kind of the pattern for the next several slides. So here, now, so um, these are rank ordered by percent favorable. So at the top, you'll have the, the, the topic area where, where teachers responded most favorably about their students. So in, in this case, um, emotion regulation was one of the highest rated um, topic areas, and then self-management at, at the lowest area. Again, these are K2 students, so you might expect that that, that might be the case. Um, this survey does not have a national percentile that we can compare it to at this point. And then the upper right of each slide, I have um, the response rate um, or an estimated response rate based on the population that we're surveyed. And then I'll switch to now the uh, students in grades three through 12. So these students responded themselves to the surveys. Um, and again, similar pattern here. So we, we've got uh, a few more topics um, that are addressed 
Um, and not all of them are in all grade levels. You'll notice that the diversity and inclusion topic was only asked of grades 6 through 12 students, but the rest of the topics, um, all students in grades 3 through 12 um, responded. So we'll move to the, the results. <clears throat> so again, these are sorted from most favorable at the top to least favorable at the bottom. But also this data set gives us a national percentile. So students in grades three through five, um, supportive relationships was um, one of the most favorable rated items as well as it, it was you know, 80th percentile in the national data set. And so one of the examples that I noted here about the um, emotion regulation, so only 53% of the students responded favorably here, but that's actually quite high when we consider how students in that age group respond in the nation. So it's helpful to have kind of a, a dual lens to look at some of these data sets when we have that to make decisions moving forward. And now we'll move to the grades 6 through 12, and you'll see here there's some differences here. You'll notice just in color coding. So I, I tried to color code the national percentiles that were below the 50th percentile in orange so we could kind of see where there might be some areas where we might need to dig deeper and do some more investigative work. And again, they're still um, sorted by percent favorable um, from, from high to low. So we can see here that there's some things we might need to um, investigate, you know, especially looking at the orange ones, teacher-student relationships. And, and I'll summarize some of those um, in the last slide. Notice here the response rate was a bit lower um, for secondary students, and even lower when we look at just the high school age students. So that's one of the things that we um, highlighted as, as an area for need going forward. And here are the two topics for staff, sense of belonging and well-being, and their uh, responses to those. I don't have a clear number of staff there, but we'll, we can update that to give you a, a uh, response rate uh, once I get a handle on the staff that um, were given the survey. And then here are the topics teachers were asked about um, throughout the year. <coughs> and then following up with um, the results. So again, we'll see, we see some patterns here um, that we can draw on. Um, <coughs> Also, a little bit lower response rate, so we'll, we'll, we'll um, um, investigate some of that further. And here are the topics in a little bit more detail from the family survey. And then again, um, we did customize this survey quite a bit because we don't have the national percentile to compare to, um, but we do have the percent favorable from high to low. And the response rate, we kind of just, it's an estimate, about 9%, because we, um, we had about 1,300 responses, and if we estimate about one response per household, although we didn't track households and responses, so that's just kind of an estimate about, you know, if we were to survey every single household and, and then track down a survey, um, potentially it could have been about a 9 or 10% um, households responding. So this slide, um, is I'm a big big proponent of small multiples, like seeing a real high level view. So it's kind of a satellite view of, so this is everything I've just showed you all in one slide. Um, so it's, um, it's not the most easy to kind of make sense of when you think of looking at individual topics or students, but what it does give is a, a big layout of one, um, kind of where that triangulation can happen. So um, it gives us a good kind of roadmap of what topics are we looking at across all groups so we can see if there's some sort of trends or some sort of themes we can run through all of our students or staff or teachers or family. Um, so this kind of gives us a cross from, from left to right, like which groups had similar items um, that they responded to, but also if we can see some patterns that might, might reveal them to us in terms of like, you know, do we see groupings of orange? That might mean, hey, this is an area we might need to focus on. Do we see groupings of, you know, real high numbers so we know, hey, this is a place where we can kind of um, lean into some of our, the good work we're doing. So based on that um, uh, real high level view, here's some of the areas that we, we saw some, some positive um, impact based on some of our dynamic goals. So um, the ones in the green here, teacher-student relationships, diversity inclusion, emotion regulation, and sense of belonging were high in the national um, benchmark. Um, when we compare ourselves to the rest of the nation. 
and um, supportive relationships were rated quite highly for, for all students that responded in grades 3 through 12 um, uh, in the surveys this year. And here's a summary of some of the areas that we might need to kind of dig deeper. You know, are there some additional things you went to look at, or are some of these things real? Um, <clears throat> so here are the ones that were kind of more, more um, low performing in terms of percentile ranking or percent favorable, some things we might need to dig into deeper. And one of the things that Panorama suggests for districts is to kind of identify one to two areas to focus on that might have the most leverage and the most impact in, 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 your, in our context to kind of dig into and focus effort on. So, you know, one of the things we might look at here is growth mindset um, uh, for students and teachers. That was some of the lower rates. So that's a commonality we saw. Um, that's one of the things we can kind of dig into and um, investigate further. And then again at the bottom here, you know, increasing response rates is always a good idea so we have a little bit more confidence in, in the data that we're looking at. And then we have links to each of the summary reports that has item and topic level uh, responses for each of the surveys at the end of the year. And next is systematic alignment. Thank you. So as uh, Mr. Brandon uh, spoke to earlier, throughout the summer we've been partnering with our Panorama team to make sense of, you know, this baseline data, right, the, the family survey baseline and, and looking at how does it, what connections can we make to the other surveys uh, that we've used and, and all of the data that we have. So together we concluded um, that we really can be more strategic in both how and when we gather information from our stakeholders. So we, you know, in our, our conversations, we really uh, came to the belief that uh, being more intentionally efficient um, in our survey administration will improve engagement. We heard that from our stakeholders, um, you know, and, and we've talked about it before together, the, you know, the concept of survey fatigue, and, and especially, you know, everybody has a lot going on. Um, so, so thinking about uh, uh, finding ways to uh, improve engagement um, and to get uh, results that are timely and are really meaningful um, thinking about uh, how and not just how we give the surveys but when so that that data is immediately actionable um, so to that end uh, we're making some adjustments to our surveying of students teachers and staff and are dividing our family survey into two smaller instruments right um, you know thinking back to that the, the k-12 survey and mr. Brandon uh, spoke to it you know we got a lot of good information but we got a lot of good information at the end of the year um, and you know that's hard to unpack plan and for buildings to use when they're returning with their staffs um, you know in, in a lot of ways it's like the M step data that we get right it's hard for us to, to really engage in good planning uh, over the summer for the fall using MSTEP data, right? Like it's one of, and that's why we, we use NWEA uh, so much in our, our planning, because it gives us good, actionable, real-time data. Um, so we believe this uh, redesign will, will help us by giving us the real-time data at multiple points of the year, and that's gonna better position us to look for connections and patterns within the data set as a whole. So uh, on the slide you can see, we'll continue the student and staff uh, data, but then looking at uh, splitting up the family survey into two, two portions. So what does that look like in, in the timeline? So with respect to uh, the students, uh, the feedback we received from them in the verbatims told us that three administrations were too many. Um, we got that very specifically when the high school administrators met with with their their students um, and we were it appeared to us because our participation was better in the fall than it was in the winter and or the spring um, that you know having these multiple surveys negatively impacted uh, 
participation. So in response, we're going to move to two administrations, one in the fall and one in the spring. We believe that these two administrations will provide us actionable information in the fall and then allow for year-end comparisons in the spring to see how well, uh, what kind of impact the things that we uh, put into place had for students over the course of the year. Uh, we received similar feedback from staff and are going to move to one winter adult perception survey. So the information that we're going to gather in the winter will be able to use immediately, like it'll be able to be addressed by the buildings uh, with their staffs in their staff meetings, but it'll also be able to use it at the building level and at dis the district level um, as we plan in February and March and April when we, we begin to do it uh, for next year's professional learning to help us uh, make informed budget decisions um, using that, that winter data. Um, and then we're going to, our plan is to uh, gauge the effectiveness of the responses we put in place to that data um, by comparing the winter staff data from one year to another. So really looking at we're making changes, we're responding to the data, and then what kind of feedback do we get that next winter? And then finally, with respect to our families, we're going to split the survey into two smaller sections. So instead of asking families at the end of a school year to spend 45, 50 minutes going through the survey, splitting the survey into, into two sections. Um, and we're doing this uh, with intentionality. So in the fall, we're going to ask families uh, questions about their perceptions of and actual statements about how they, how and when they engage in their students' schooling, um, both with their students, but also their interactions with the school, um, and how they believe, how well they believe their child perseveres through challenges. So in the fall, that data is going to be really valuable to schools, uh, as well as the uh, family, uh, student family engagement department, as we're planning how do we support our students and our families during the school year? How do we help them uh, engage? How do we help them remain engaged? And it's early in the year information about the students in front of us. So think about it as really a baseline of how we're going to work uh, with the students. We're asking families and the student, uh, asking families basically what they need for us, from us, and how can we partner with them. Um, then in the spring, we'll ask families more direct questions uh, as to their perceptions of the district's strengths and opportunities for growth. Uh, so that'll provide important feedback, uh, telling us what our families believe, uh, how well we did uh, with respect to educating and supporting their students. Um, but also, there are questions on there that ask families to um, give us their perceptions of what should be district priorities over the next three years. So we'll really get a uh, not only a good look at what families uh, believe in terms of uh, the education and support that we're providing for them and their students, but also we'll be able to get some insight into what families value and what they believe uh, should be directions for the district over the next three years. So uh, when it comes to next steps, currently we're working with Panorama to create those fall and spring family surveys. So uh, pulling apart uh, that one big survey, looking at additional topics, and as Mr. Flukes uh, alluded to, looking for places where we can find alignment um, in survey topics across multiple areas. So we really, so we can, can triangulate the data and we can make sense of um, and draw bigger conclusions from multiple data sources. Um, and then we're going to prepare for the administration of these surveys throughout the year. Um, in addition, uh, we have a panoramic strategic advisor, um, and we're working with uh, him to ensure that our, our administrator professional learning throughout the year is and that it includes a specific analysis of the data and then support in helping administrators um, share that data with their staff throughout the year. And with that, questions? All right, now I'll uh, start to my right. Yes, it would. Um, Thank you. This is a lot of 
thank you. This is a lot of work. Um, I think one of the things that stood out to me is is on the teacher um, section, the low percentiles in educating all students and the growth mindset, and I'm. It, to me, that indicates a real issue, you know, that, that we need to do something to better, mo better support our teachers and, and encourage them. I'm wondering if, if the staff has any comments or thoughts on how that can be addressed. Yep, I can feel that. So that, that does a direct through line to the professional learning pieces that we're, we've been talking about and discussing as a teaching and learning department around um, better supporting teachers and how to utilize the what's called the MTSS, multi-tiered systems of supports, to look at the needs of each student and how to best meet the needs of each student from that level, but also all the way down into the, how do we really look at formative and summative assessments? How do we dig into formative assessments to do actionable um, uh, work with students earlier? How do we best differentiate instruction for students? Um, the growth mindset and grit pieces that you saw on there, and especially looking at some of the, if you look and dive down into the questions about my ability or a teacher's ability, a staff member's ability to grow their own skills, as well as we see a parallel with our students about their ability. So that gives us some very actionable things around what's called cognitive science and really understanding how the brain works and how learning works. So those are all things we're incorporating into our ongoing professional development, our year-long PD um, planning, starting from next week with the administrator retreat all the way through our opening day and long-term this year and beyond to really dive down and deeply into that to ensure that it directly ties into that very thing. Because um, that, along with some of the research that and the data we've gotten from Hanover, talking about our teachers saying that um, they feel like they need to be strengthened in MTSS and um, various uh, learning uh, preferences and how to support students and the listening sessions that we have done as a team, sitting, listening to our teachers, it all directly correlates together. So it gives us very actionable work around our long-term and short-term professional development work. So thank you for the complete answer. <laughs> So uh, thank you, Ms. Wester, for asking that question because that was the one that really stood out to me as well. And But the related piece of that is is the response rate. The teacher's response rate, I mean, to be honest, it's 25%. Correct. That shows a level of apathy that is really concerning to me um, because they're, they're not providing the data that is so important for us to be able to uh, drive our dynamic plan and to be able to support the, the, the teachers in this process. Yep. I've got a related question, but I'll, yep. I'll, I'll get your feedback on that. And I'm happy to take that one too, and then gentlemen, if you want to step in. The one thing that is an actionable shift for us is thinking about how we dedicate time in a staff meeting to ensuring that our teachers have a greater opportunity to do that. Uh, this year, as it was administered, there was a window of time that allowed for that. But it also tells us we need to do a better job as a team, as a district, about helping people understand what are we using this data for. So this was the first time that teachers took the um, took this, and so tying it back into helping them understand this helps us with professional learning, this helps us with budgeting, this helps us with programming. Um, we need to do a better job in, in doing that very thing. If I'm going to spend time doing something, what's going to become of it? We need to make that direct tie-in for people in a better way. Okay, thank you. And then the related one um, in that exact same uh, process is the student K-12 response rate. These are, I believe, where teachers are rating their students as part of that process. The K-2, yes, Camp, that's sorry, correct. K-2, yep. sorry, I'm sorry. That's correct. I meant yep. K-2. Yep. So my struggle with that is it's 86%. Mm -hmm. That means that 14% of our students didn't get a rating because those teachers didn't bother to submit the reports. Is that right? Um, I'm not sure. So uh, we would have to look back at the data, but it, it appears that I, I'd have to dive deeper into it to see that for sure. And it may be that um, we may have had a, a sub in the building for a time or something. I, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to dive deep I, into it. But I'm not theoretically, expecting 100%, yes. yep. but I, I expect that to be in the high 90s mm -hmm. for that kind of process because otherwise we're not supporting our students in this work. You know, this is really important data, especially the way Panorama analyzes or provides mm -hmm. that uh, information across the entire student process. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm concerned about the... The, both the apathy and teachers taking it as well as the 
the 14 percent of students that, that didn't even get a chance to have their information uh, considered. I, I want to applaud the, the teachers that uh, helped administer this for the grade three to five level, 91 percent. I mean, that's awesome. Those mm -hmm. kids are engaged mm -hmm. in that process. I mean, that's, yep. that's an admirable response rate yep. when individuals are doing it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this should be part of their job responsibility to be doing that one at the K-2 level. Yeah, I just want to lift both of what uh, Member Westra and Kehoe said in terms of the looking at the gaps and response rate. So you're hearing from us that we want to see response rates increase. Um, but specifically, what happened with students in grades 6 through 12 where the response rate went down from 91 to 48? Did the students not take that during school, like during um, seminar, advisory period? So the, over the, the period uh, of time, the advisory time at the high school was a time that it, uh, was set aside for it, and advisory at the middle school was the time to set, that was set aside for it. Um, the response rates went down over the years, so like the response rates that you see there is from our, our spring data when we're looking across the year. Um, and the response rates for middle school were higher than the high school. And again, that would lead us to the actionable of two things, is ensuring that, um, that there's follow-up on the accountability of taking the assessment and also helping uh, our students understand what is this assessment for as well so that they see the value in these assessments as well so that they understand that this is giving us data to be able to um, provide feedback. Um, in listening sessions, the high school administrators sat down with students and they heard two things very strongly. One, we're overwhelmed with surveys, and two, we don't really know what these surveys are for, so therefore that's a, t a direct line for us, again, to do a better job of letting everyone know, okay, this is what this data is being used for. You know, we talk about it and it's making sure that that information that we talk about here, that we talk about in our meetings, that we talk about at the administrative level, makes it all the way down to our students so that they understand the value and purpose of the surveys and that they see value in it mm -hmm. because it directly helps support the programs that we put in place for them. And same for the families, looking at that 9% rate is also very concerning and low. So there's a lot of work to be done and I'm not sure uh, if that's already been discussed in terms of how you're gonna target that. It's been discussed very much. We're actually already hard at work making sure there's a year-long plan for communicating it. We do think breaking the survey into two, making them shorter will help, but above all, we just need to make sure and um, constantly message to our families the importance of this survey. I think it's been a common theme so far. Why take these surveys? Because they directly lead to decision-making and using our community's voice. The other thing that I, is important to point out is we administered this year's spring survey a little bit too late. Uh, May 15th. Uh, this year, we have a whole year to plan for it and a strategic plan around that. Last year, it really was just a few months. So by the time we had the survey instrument right, we launched it as quickly as possible. We wanted to make sure the survey was right before we launched it. But this year, we're going to be way further ahead of it. We feel confident we're going to be able to, to raise that participation number. We agree completely that that number needs to go up. Uh, just a clarifying yep. question. Uh, in terms of the summary reports, if you could go to that slide, I just need clarity on. <clears throat> so let's go to the third survey link. Yeah, if you could just open it. I just need clarity on what since last survey means. So if you just go to maybe the third, second, third slide. So those orange numbers mm -hmm. saying since last survey, that's the last survey from fall to spring? Uh, if there was a middle of the year, it will, it will go back to the middle of the year one, but if it was like one that, so I think most of our surveys were, had at least a middle of the year, so it's looking back to the <coughs> middle of the year administration. Is what okay. That is. Yep. So as you see, in some of those, I saw a lot of down arrows, mm -hmm. not a huge discrepancy. Some, I think early grades show us some positive growth from the previous survey, uh, but the secondary surveys have a lot of alarms from the previous survey and in some of the data that we're looking at, such as sense of belonging, teacher-student relationship. So there's a lot of work that needs to happen at the secondary levels 
and I'm sure it's, I'm not telling you something yep. that you don't know, but just to say that it's really concerning. Yep, and the high school team has been working on that over the summer. They're, that's actually one of their major areas of focuses. It, uh, of focus is um, relationships and sense of belonging. They're very aware of this. They've been diving into this data. Um, as they talking a lot about the the other three R's rigor rele relevance and and relationships a key on relationships so as we launch the year we're going to be talking deeply about the importance of relationships for learning the real pl re uh, importance of relationships across the board for helping student achievement and growth and engagement so it it is very much in everyone's awareness as we've looked at this data and we've talked about this data for not just at the district level but all the way down through the buildings and kind of beyond so that's been our planning work all summer around this very kind of topic especially at the secondary level we we're very aware of this data are you getting responses from them as to why uh, why teachers feel that way has that have you dug into that or that's the work that's going to happen why teachers that feel that way or students we're talking about both, students here both so. I mean at the secondary level yes but you're talking about PD with teachers right now yes we're talking about developing we're, we're talking about launching with the f the f so let me kind of step back the the administrative team has been talking about the the focus with throughout the building on on ensuring positive relationships so there's there's multiple things we believe we've talked with some done some focus groups and stuff um, the pandemic hit people hard coming out of the pandemic hit people hard there's been you know stu there's a lot of um, multiple kind of facets that are coming into this um, there's a lot of uh, social, emotional, and mental health things going on that have have made it very. Teachers are expressing that they have been exhausted by a lot of the work because of the depth of need of students. So we are working on how do we help mm -hmm. twofold with that. Right. One with the um, mental health and relationships of teachers, mental health and relationships of students, and collaboratively together. So student family engagement, all of this stuff is intentional to help support that. As we've talked with different focus groups of folks, um, it's, just, it's been a difficult couple of years. That's not to make any excuses. We've got a lot of work to do to reestablish where we are in relationships together in supporting each other and really diving deeply into and building um, just the whole efficacy of everyone right so so you, I mean yeah. so you got the work going with yes, focus groups and looking listening the work's to going different twofold. groups the, okay. the planning work the development work the launch work and the continued conversation work spending more time also just kind of sitting side by side with people and, and hearing and and working on all of that stuff so yes I have one more question, but I'll come back. Okay, perfect. Josh. Uh, I guess what really struck me was the family engagement percent on slide 25, I think it was, um, which was the favorable section. Uh, this had no available comparison with the national percentile, but even then it turned on a light bulb for me. So um, this may already be going on, but have you considered leveraging the great work the family engagement office is doing on larger activities and getting them involved in building level in the at the building level to bring a unified approach to family engagement across buildings and levels so like it's more smaller so it's more focused so that you bring in the engagement like I know uh, for example at Tonda Elementary when parents came in including my parents like it kind of helped move and get the like school going and then it brought in family engagement as well so like things like that where you can just work I guess. <laughs> more like um, a personalized approach yeah. talking about building yeah relationships yeah. any other comments or questions no nope, that's it perfect great job uh christensen okay um Thank you for the presentation. I really like how the data was packaged. I think that made it very manageable um, and, and, and easy for us to understand and digest. Um, I appreciate my other board colleagues' comments because I wholeheartedly agree with those. Um, but I did have a wondering about the reorganization of when to issue the surveys. Um, 
you know, we talk a lot about the comparing this to the nat national average and leaning into the, the, the tool um, as the national d data set, or excuse me, the tool that allows us to compare to the national data set. Does Panorama have any recommendations as to when some of these surveys should be issued? Success stories or benchmarking where, hey, we've gotten more family engagement when we've released a survey in the spring versus in the uh, fall or vice versa. Just curious if that's that's a an option or opportunity for yeah, us. Yeah, that, that's a great question. They did they did not say that giving the survey at any particular time led to more engagement. Really, it that's more about our work in communicating the purpose and getting the word out there. Like, here's the way we're using the the data. The timing piece was. Um, the advice feedback we got is is really giving the surveys in such a way that the data is something you can act upon, right? Mm -hmm. Like that that really has come through um, in our work with them, uh, you know, very very clearly is having having a very specific plan of giving the survey, looking at the data, and and as you know, an administrative team, but then. How are you sharing data with teachers? Like how, because that's the, the action that we're looking at. Or if it's family engagement data, then how is a building responding to make sure that whatever, you know, if it's a barrier to engagement or, you know, if there's something that comes out of that data, being able to respond to it then so that um, the stakeholders Need, needs are met, but they're also, you know, that's the seen and heard, right? Like, if you can, if I give you information and you can meet my needs or at least communicate to me why you can't, then, right, I'm a partner. So it's more about acting on the data mm -hmm. to drive engagement rather than when do you give it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the question as well. I think one of the exciting things about the new model for the family survey, in previous incarnations, we always would collect the data in the spring. By the time we reported it, present it to the Board of Education, it was basically summer. So you're always in next school year mode. Right. One of the really exciting things about this fall administration is we can during the school year. So we're getting the voice of our families at two different touch points. Mm -hmm. But one of those touch points is the current school year. We can immediately apply that data to the student experience. And we're really excited about that. And Panorama certainly endorsed that idea for sure. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Member Carr. Okay. Well, I just have a concern because we want to encourage uh, families to participate in surveys. And I think what was just displayed recently, even though it's a different topic, um, people put time into to answering a survey and it didn't really matter. So I just want to say that I think we need to, you know, uh, nobody's paying attention all the time about which sur survey applies to what, but I just think that's going to be a concern as far as getting more people to engage into a survey when they spend the time to do a survey and it doesn't really get acknowledged. Um, the other, my other concern is um, that, um, you know, some of the stress on the teachers, I think, like when I was reading the survey for the 6th to 12th grade, well, first of all, you have to look at the age group. You know, they have a lot of things going on personally and just from my own experience, my own children and their friends, a lot of them just don't like to share things. I mean, I mean, it's like, where's this information going? It's my private information. I don't want to give information. And I'd rather be doing my homework and getting stuff done or talking to my friends. So I just think that that's one of the kind of a normal response out of that age group. Um, but when I was looking at the survey, um, when they ask of these kids about their teachers, um, you know, how many, I don't know, if you walked into a class upset, how many of your teachers would be concerned? Well, first of all, how many teachers would know you're upset? And kids display being upset in so many different ways that, you know, to hold account, a teacher accountable that she didn't engage a student because they were upset seems pretty extreme to me because I don't, the teacher's intent, what they're trained for is to give information, teach information they're not qualified certified counselors and the expectations what i'm seeing is that we're expecting so much out of teachers to engage everything and, and like this other this other question um if you came back to visit class three years from now how many of your teachers would be excited to see you well 
just working in my preschool experience, like three years, I went, from one, I may not recognize them. Number two, out of all the kids you have, how would you even remember their names sometimes? You might recognize a face somewhat, but like, I'm sure any teacher is excited about somebody coming back. Um, but it's kind of a question that, like, that's a lot of expectation out of a teacher. If she's not having a extremely happy day, um, you know, she may be very busy, and the perceptions that are coming out are not really fair to the teachers, I think. And, and I mean, a lot of these questions about their teachers, um, are they really, in, you know, asked how you're doing how many of them are really interested in your answer well you know they've they're, they've got like how many kids in their class they're interested but they may not show a, an extreme interest like oh wow how are you doing I mean they 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 are people too they have things going on in their lives and and so I just think the expectations that we're putting on added to what their first job is is to teach and instruct um, we've kind of changed that it's so much student-centered now that that direct teacher direct um, teachers when they used to just give information and help that I don't even remember some of my teachers like like personally always I went to class I did what I was supposed to do and and I didn't expect every teacher to worry about every little mood I had so and, ch and children's moods change constantly so I, I kind of think that the teachers are overwhelmed because of the expectations they're not licensed therapists and I think you know social emotional learning I'm really concerned about that because um, I personally, as a parent, would not want a teacher giving my kid some advice that I might not agree with. And so I just kind of think there's a lot, and they can get in trouble for a lot for saying things. So I, I just think there's a lot of stress on them right now. And I think that the focus should first be what, what are they educating? And if some child is upset and they have five chi children that are upset in there, there's got to be a avenue that they can send them somewhere down to the principal or somewhere to get extra help. I, I just think to put that burden all on them is beyond. So that was one of my concerns. And then, um, and the questions. And, and a lot of times people are very concerned about like, well, where's my questions going? Who's gonna see my answers? And can they trace it? And so I think a lot of surveys um, ask a lot of maybe not necessary questions, like more like how, are, what's your favorite book might be a good question. Do you like to read? Like more educational related. I, I think everybody has emotional things and there are some kids I agree that are probably struggling more but um, everybody has a different way of handling it and I think maybe that's a parent thing so that's I don't that's what I have to say so but I appreciate them engaging and having some kind of way of finding out but I these questions were kind of especially for the early young children oh and oh yeah there was one more thing I knew there was and, and also the perspective on um, some of the questions, the questions too that I was concerned about. Ah, sorry, I had this on here. Here it is. Um, for this age group and the younger age group was these questions on how do you spend time at school with different races, ethnicities, or cultures? Almost never, once in a while, sometimes. I mean, a lot of times kids don't even notice that. They're just, they go and they, they hang around kids who like to do the things they like to do. I don't remember when my kids were in sports, and I think they weren't really looking at like, like where these people are coming from. They just engaged in how they could gauge with each other. And the other thing is, um, so let's say you only have two kids that are different than you in your class. Are they gonna feel awful now because I didn't engage with that student? Or because that student is a different ethnicity, well maybe I don't wanna hang out with them because they're not doing their homework, they're goofing off. I mean, there's lots of reasons why not, but, but if a child puts on there, not at all in that class, what, how are they gonna be held? Is it, are they gonna look at, oh, well, you're racist, or you're not, help, you're not being empathetic, or you're not doing, following all these rules? So I kind of worry about the outcomes and how they're viewed and how kids are gonna be, um, the expectations on them, and I just think that, you know, we're, 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 we're dividing them by, oh, you, you know, a lot of them, ethnicities, cultures, races. I mean, like, what what's ethnicities? I mean, I mean, nobody would know that I had any Lebanese, you know, ethnicities or anything. I mean, it's like so unless I bring. Member Picard, can I know. create some room for other board members? Yes, you can. Because honestly, you're just kind of all yeah. over the place. I'm finding I'm it hard to follow. I'm not all over the place. I'm not over the place. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm just, I just, just I particularly can't follow it. going. I'm going to pass um, along to Member McCoy. Well, I'm sorry that that I didn't get to uh, explain that. So. All right, well, you shut me down again, thank you. So, 
on this, the 6 to 12, and there was a 48% response rate. So tiny. Is there any, um, like when I was looking at the information, were there more high school kids that took it or more middle school kids that took this? Was there like a bigger percent? Yeah, the, um, if we're to, we do have the information like by grade level and, and, and even building level as well. And, and I think the response rate at the middle school grades was probably in the 78%. Okay. And then so and then at the high schools around like 27, 28%. So okay. definitely much lower in grades 9 through 12. So definitely an area of focus um, for <clears throat> um, kind of getting kids to understand why they should share this information because they see some impact in some of the work they do. So I think maybe one of the things they might be looking for is, is kind of a response to what they're saying. And so I think maybe right. if they see change or if they see hey, we, we give some surveys at the beginning of the year and I'm seeing some visual change, I'm gonna see maybe be engaged more to, to, to take it, so that's the hope. Yeah, because when you don't get a very high response rate, it's hard to know if these are universal issues or just the people that answered the question. Because my biggest concern in here was clearly the sense of belonging in there because I think that most research shows that children who don't feel they belong are not going to have good relationships and then they're not going to do well. Like they have to have that sense of belonging before they're going to really engage with their schoolwork. Um, so um, I appreciate that this is a, a big topic of focus for the district. And I also appreciate the fact that you have seen that the survey fatigue is real and um, maybe doing them smaller and less often will get a higher response rate. Um, most of my questions were answered previously because I think we almost pretty much have the same questions. Um, but I did, I did have a follow-up question to um, Ms. Sadu was talking, no, Mr. Keogh, that you, you were both talking about the K to two teachers. So you talked about having some staff meeting time to fill out the survey for the teachers. Is there dedicated time set aside for the K to two teachers to be doing this? Yes, in their yes, there is dedicated time. And, and then um, when we first when we first rolled it out, and then ongoing is also some support in how to administer it okay. so that it do, it doesn't become an extensive amount of time taken away from instruction because we want to uh, we want to um, make sure that we are very much supporting instructional time thank you all right we'll go back around if there's additional questions uh, I don't believe so at this time <laughs> so I have a couple so I, I want to echo all, everything that the uh, the other board members have said um, I did want to touch on two things one uh, the question that uh, Ms. Picard uh, raised uh, around the confidentiality and how this data is used. I know that surveys um, can be done in an anonymous fashion or they can be done in a way that we can identify the students so that we can then act on those items for a particular student. Can you give us some context for this particular survey and these, this work that we're doing? Is this anonymous data or is this data that is part of the individual student's panorama record? So both um, Can I so the k2 uh, teacher perception is connected to the students so that um, we can provide support if needed in those uh, specific areas you see there when you look um, for students in grades 3 through 12 uh, diversity and inclusion and teacher-student relationships, um, places where we're getting student perception on the, their environment and how we're responding to their needs, that is anonymous. Pieces where you're looking at emotional regulation, self-management, social awareness, when you're talking about social-emotional competencies, those are specific to the students. 
So and that's that's communicated to families and students ahead of time. Okay, great. That was my, my next question. Thank yeah. you. you, you, you it's within the letter that goes out to all families in the beginning of the year. Is it included? It's, it's good that it's included at the beginning of the year, but is it included in the survey itself? And because I think that if, if students feel that this information is going to be non-anonymous, it may reduce their response rate in some cases. They may choose to not participate at all. Um, and is there options for students to be able to provide that feedback in an anonymous way if they don't feel comfortable in providing that information in that student-specific way? In other words, there's a feeling or a fear that this information may be held against the students, where I know that that isn't our intention. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's not feedback that we've gotten from students. Okay. Um, so you know, and, and now I, I will say I didn't specifically sit with the high school, but when, when we debrief with the high school administrators, that wasn't feedback that we received. Okay. Um, I'm just looking feedback at the 25% that we, participation yeah. rate. That concerns what, me. One of the big pieces of feedback was actually, and, and this was consistent even with some of the, the middle school students, was not not knowing how this information is being like i'm not seeing anything come of this you're getting my opinions but what's the action coming out of it and then the other piece is um that instead of doing this like i would you know it's more meaningful to me to uh get you know use that time to do homework or to read which dovetails with the not knowing how this information is being used or not seeing some uh, some either results or just even debriefing of it. Perfect, and that actually brings me exactly to my next question, and that has to do with the timing of this. Um, can we go to the slide that's got the, the, the timing of when these surveys will be uh, done, uh, the, the survey administration? So I'm, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the, the uh, specifically the, the staff and the family feedback um, one. So first of all, I assume that staff means staff and teachers, correct? Because correct. you broke out both staff yep. and teachers in the, in the data, but I assume that this is both staff and teachers. Correct, and, and really it's, it's adults, uh, the adult survey, and okay. it's um, depending upon uh, an individual's role they will either get a teacher survey or okay, a staff survey. So that we might want to clarify that when we're communicating it because we, we have talked yep. about them differently. And I think the timing of that is outstanding because it really fits into the budget process and the work that we're doing for transformation and how we align our strategies and what we do as a district uh, to where our resources are applied. My concern is with the family one, and I see two lines there. I see April and May. W which, which surveys are done in April and which are done in May? So be the SEL competencies and then the supports in the environment, those would be administered to students before state testing, so uh, early April. Um, and then the family feedback, the April-May piece was just part of the communication in terms of us working with Panorama to, to pick the correct time. So ultimately my concern of that is, is the same one uh, for budget transformation. You know, our budget cycle begins in March and April is when we go through the process of identifying the priorities for us as a district and the work that we're doing. And it was articulated here this evening really well that this survey provides opportunities for families to help influence the work that we're doing across the, the, the next se several years in, in the work that's happening. But if we're not doing this until May, our budget's locked in. That, that transformation work has already occurred there. So I, I would advocate that perhaps we move that family one back into a period where we can actually action that as part of our, our transformation process. Thank you. Thank you. Member Sidhu. Yes, I have one question. If you could go uh, to the slide that shows priority areas. So you, you had mentioned that Pan Panorama suggested that you pick a few, not all, because it's a lot to take on. So if you look ahead to next year, around this time, based on the data that you will now have gathered, hopefully with more people, so besides growing the, the number of respondents, what do you hope to see in areas of, of improvement based on the interventions that are being discussed? All of them. Right. So you're so, going to target all of them. Yeah. Well, but <laughs> so thinking about things that ha thinking about things that 
that dovetail with each other. So if if we're looking at um, growth mindset and grit, right? Grit being perseverance, growth mindset being that I can change over time um, something that I am not happy with where I am, right? I can grow over time. Um, and that my intelligence and my abilities um, to a large extent aren't static. So those two things have to happen before, right? So that concept of productive struggle, right? Kids perceive and they believe that if I keep working at something and then how does that connect with teacher-student relationships? How, how are teachers and students communicating with each other and, and challenging each other to get better and to improve and working together and collaborating. Um, so thinking about, and then within a professional development and MTSS, that concept of educating all students. So all of those things dovetail um, together. Um, so yes, we'd so we'd love to see them all Screenshot grow. this and hope to see yep. huge improvements. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So. Vice President Christian. No more questions. Right. Member of Card. I assume I'm done. <laughs> All right. I'm, really cool. I'm okay, Rick. Thank you. Right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Great presentation. There's a lot of information. Lots of information. Mm -hmm. Lots of information. One, one quick thing. I love the overview slide. I, that was, that was yeah. my favorite slide. I love the snapshot where you can see it all and see the trends. Um, that that's extremely helpful. Thank I, you. I, I would echo that. The way you guys pulled the information together and communicated it was really outstanding. So it really was. Thank you. Thank you for that. A really team effort. Really and quickly. At the end, where you could like Sorry, go oh, in right. go ahead, to get a deeper you dive. You did. Uh, did I forget you? Again? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm gonna sit you I mean, right I did say though right. that I was done, but I got <laughs> something else. So I'll, I'll give I'll, you. I some didn't even slide. come back for the second. I'm sorry. Josh. It's it's perfectly fine. So um, I'm gonna try bringing this into like a student in the 612 category and there's two things that come to mind uh, like what was said already that the communicating the data that is being taken versus what is anonymous and then what is being done with the data so that they see okay I'm sure my data is being used but then okay something's actually going to get done that will impact either me or someone else that I know and then you might as a bonus thing, I know I said two, you might want to um, increase or decrease the time al allocated for the survey. So, and I don't know how this is, but I know a lot of students that I know personally just pushed it off and then were like, oh, it's past the window. Mm. So, and it's, we're in high school, so we're busy, but if you realize that, okay, I have a week to do this, let's just do it now. Whereas instead of having like, I don't, I don't even remember how long we had, but uh, students pushed it off and pushed it off and pushed it off because mm -hmm. we had multiple advisory periods allocated to it and you only really need one. So if you just had one dedicated time, even if it's just the time to do it, but it remains open the whole time, then students will most likely have be more like inclined to do it because they have only one time to do it. Uh, and that's what I was thinking. Any questions with that? I know I said a lot and really fast. Yeah, so, so Nick, to, to that point, how, what are your thoughts on, um, what are your initial thoughts on how you're going to communicate the, you know, the wins? Because you took the survey last year, this, um, this occurred, right, to better your, your experience at PSEP or PCCS overall. Sure, it's a great question. I think it goes back to the, the two slides in terms of the positive impact, making sure that we're reinforcing those, putting intentional work behind them, and keeping those percentiles and those percentages strong. And then very intentional behind the next slide, which is the focus support, looking for growth in all these areas. Yeah, but sure. but I guess I'm I'm thinking based on what Josh said, I'm thinking is there a, you know, was there a decision, something that changed that specifically happened because of the survey that you, that we can go back to the students and say, because you took this survey, we added X or we did X or we, you know, finally covered the walkway at PSEP. Um, <laughs> no, 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 we finally, no. we finally did that. <laughs> Monorail is being installed. <laughs> That's great. That's great question. I, I think to your point, the key is communicating that, identifying it during the school year. Our new survey calendar will allow us to do more real time uh, touch points and communicate that out to our community and most importantly our students to say here's what you told us here's what we did yeah. and really celebrate that publicly I think and Josh right. Josh that's something you can help us with too because you're yeah. sitting at the table now so when you hear us making the uh, decisions that uh, you know we're tied back to the survey 
you know, flag that for us and say this is maybe something that we should elevate yeah. um, to the student body because I know that it came out of out of the, the survey. Well, because the thing is, too, is like I know most high schoolers aren't going to care if we go up like 10 percent tile points. So like <laughs> seeing something real happen, even if it's like not actually a real thing, but something that happened because of it is something right. that would actually maybe create like change in the future. So even if the same amount of people take it next year, but then you show that something happened because of it, then more students will take the survey most likely next year. Right. Tell the story, right? I was going to share also as you look to the r analysis by building. So part of uh, Mr. Brandon's work is to sit down with each building, go through their reports, and then they utilize that as a part of their school mm -hmm. improvement process when they develop their goals. Um, and as we're really, really further looking to get this dashboard, which will have some metrics to say if we're developing these goals and these are ways that we're incorporating student voice and these are elements that we heard as a focus we're going to set this goal as a building because it'll be you know specific to buildings as well and then to be able to say what is the actionable for this if we want to increase and how do we communicate that to our student body so really working with the building leadership to utilize the data to develop their goals and communicate out to their students and staff and families and then like if a student sorry uh, like if a student sees that something happens and they might tell their parent oh something happened with this survey so mm. the nine percent might also elevate because the student mm -hmm. saw what the potential of the survey is that's a great point great Good feedback point. josh so, josh if i may just as a question I, so gotta come to the mic the, yeah so for for example from the verbatim from students saying that three times is too much like being very intentional and saying okay we heard you and we reduced the, the numbers of surveys to two over the course of the year. And then, you know, the high school specifically in, in looking at some changes um, with respect to uh, their student support uh, that they're providing with respect to sense of belonging and grit. So looking for opportunities to reduce out of school suspension so that so that students don't feel like we are pushing them off and we're, we're giving them up on them. So like those are actions that came out of yeah. this data and just really looking for ways to like to to explain that to students and families that, hey, you know, the high school made these decisions based upon this information. Yeah. And then like just communicating that is key yeah. to students, like even if it's at the top of the survey email or whatever we have shortened it because of this survey data and yeah. what you've said, yeah. like then they'll feel hurt. Awesome. Thank you. Perspective. Thank you. Thanks for letting me. Yeah, great feedback, Josh. Thank you. All right, finance and operations. Hi, this evening we have um, a first read of the elementary playground mulch. It's a three-year agreement. Um, we apply um, mulch to all our elementary and early childhood centers on a rotating cycle. There's approximately uh, 1,298 cubic yards of mulch needed annually. Wow. Uh, we've looked at this uh, about three years ago, and we are recommending uh, Superior Ground Couple Ground Cover is the vendor in the state that offers a, a blown-in insulation, uh, and we've been using that over the last several years. This four-year agreement was uh, the previous agreement expires this year, and so we are offering uh, we've been offered a three-year a new agreement that covers the cost of the mulch. We actually did a comparison as well uh, in buying just the mulch and spreading it ourselves, but it's more cost-effective to um, purchase the blown-in mulch and have them do the work. So the total cost is at uh, $40,957.50, and that's what we are asking for as a first read. Superior Ground Cover, Inc. of Grand Rapids, Michigan. All right, I'll open up to questions. I'll start with Josh. Uh, love the savings and money from doing it that way. <laughs> Perfect. And just for context for everybody, this is about 10% uh, more expensive than our previous contract. So it's significantly lower than the kind of inflation that we've been seeing in, in other uh, agreements and processes. So we're, we're happy that this is somewhat holding the line. Great. Member Wester? Just when does the contract start? Would it, would it cover this school year coming? Because it's kind of late in the summer to be. Yes, yeah, so it's July 1st, but yeah. they haven't done the work yet. Okay. The so they will have it done before Correct. school starts. For this, this third of the district, because a third is third. Correct. <laughs> and, and what they do is they evaluate each and every building every year 
to find out which buildings need uh, mulch as part of that process. So it's they're doing uh, a revolving cycle of specific buildings. They may say, you know, there may be a specific thing that this building is going to get it this year and in three years, but it may be that if they see a specific situation in a particular building, they will include that building as part of that year. Yeah, it's part of the state law and uh, playground annual annual playground ins install inspection process um, that they do have to do that, and you have to maintain a certain level, especially fall zone, so under swings, slides, etc. Treasurer Kehoe, any questions? No, I just, it's the exciting topics that we talk about in the <laughs> finance and operations <laughs> meeting. Right, and we had about a half an hour discussion about mulch there. <laughs> no questions. No questions. Thank you. What is blown at installation? So in, in, oh, instead of spreading the mulch where they okay. dump the truck full right. of mulch and they um, you know, use a shovel or right. a rake to, to mm -hmm. do it, they actually use a, um, a hose and they blow and spread the, uh, the mulch with that process. And so Superior Ground Cover is one of the only people in the area that's doing that. In fact, they've bought up most of their competitors for that. Mm -hmm. So it's both a more efficient process as well as it gets a, uh, a, a more uniform uh, coverage of the mulch in the, in the, the playgrounds. Oh, thank you. All right. Very thank interesting. <laughs> so if you have any other questions, remember our process. If you have any additional questions on mulch, go ahead and email <laughs> superintendent <laughs> and uh, myself, and we'll be happy to uh, get back to you on it. Actually. All right, next yeah. up. Thank you. Uh, next up is an approval and agreement with TMP Associates for an ADA audit district-wide. As you know, in previous board meetings, we have adopted a certain standard um, for our ADA compliance. Mr. Dinklew is here from TMP. Mr. Grzynski is here from our uh, internal uh, director of facilities mm -hmm. and capital and pro pro capital projects to discuss this uh, this uh, service uh, requirement or service request um, at 52,240. Um, and it is a first reading for this evening, as also discussed at the FNO last Thursday on August the 3rd. Just additional for some question. additional yep. context, um, as a service contract, these things don't necessarily have to come before the full board, but we believe that this is an important topic that the board has discussed before, so we wanted to bring this thing forward yep. and see if there were any questions and also to share with the community uh, the important work that we're doing as part of this ADA audit. Now, the outcome of this will both influence the bond projects that we have that are upcoming as well as uh, provide a roadmap for us of uh, additional work that we might do in buildings that maybe have already been renovated or are part of other schedules. Fantastic. I'll just ask for any questions. I, I do have a question, um, but I, I want to thank you to Member Kehoe, Treasurer Kehoe, for bringing this to the board since it was discussed in uh, public meetings as well as the board. Uh, just shows you the importance uh, of this. I see the expected um, time frame for this is nine weeks. After that, will you present it to FNO and will that come to the board for a presentation or are you just going to keep it at FNO? So we'll present to FNO. Yeah, we'll present it to FNO and we'll look at the, the process. It'll certainly be shared in board notes, but if we see that this is, I want, want to look at the presentation first to see it. Uh, how it would come forward to the full board. Okay, thanks. Any additional questions? I have a wondering, you know, I think it's great that we're getting a consultant involved to actually go through each of our physical spaces to address some of these issues. But as we know, some families have stepped forward also highlighting these issues. So my wondering is, are we going to engage in each building's families from an accessibility lens to see if there's any um, issues that our consultants or ourselves are not seeing? That's a great point, great question. Yeah. It's a great idea, and we can reach out to each building individually and ask the principals to disseminate the information of what we're trying to accomplish and, and solicit feedback. Okay. Given that, I would recommend that we not start the audit until after the school year has, uh, has started. Yeah. So, you know, we'll, this is first read. We'll have another read uh, in two weeks before we actually do it. But, you know, we wouldn't want to start that immediately. We'd want to give the, the, the principals a chance to be able to communicate to the, to the families that this is going on. Mm -hmm. It's a really good suggestion. Yep. Yeah. And can we add parent counsel to that? Because that was one of the areas where this did come up. Mm -hmm. Good okay. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, action item 240804, consider approval of a re resolution to purchase radar speed warning signs for PSEP campus. And uh, this is a first and final reading. 
Yes. So during our FNO last week, we received a, a presentation from uh, Mr. Meyer, our Director of uh, Safety and Security. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tiskwitz is here to answer questions this evening. Uh, but this is recommending the purchase of six solar powered radar speed warning signs. So it's a sign that's uh, affixed uh, at our Plymouth Canton Educational Park that would tell you um, how fast you're going um, and uh, flash when you're over the um, posted speed sign, uh, speed limit. Um, the signs are quoted by Radar Sign Inc., uh, LLC of Marietta, Georgia at a cost of $4,995 each with an additional $88 each for the um, speed limit sign itself. Um, for a total cost for all six of about 32688 we also would probably do this work, uh, we will do this installation of concrete and installation of about $5,000 with our own staff. So we're asking the board for $37,688 in order to do this work. It would be that um, state school aid act section 97 grant funds that we were awarded in the, in the prior fiscal year. Mr. Tisquitz, did you have anything to no, you did an excellent job. Thank you. So I did have a couple of things I wanted to add into this. This is that um, this was done based upon some feedback that we've seen uh, both from um, experiential data as well as by putting uh, working with Canton Township to put in some speed monitoring that was there. And so we know that we both have people that have, have uh, reported problems as well as we have data that indicates that we have a challenge. Uh, speed signs by themselves are helpful, but there's also going to be traffic control devices there. They'll, I'm sorry, there'll be speed bumps that will be uh, applied as well. And the idea is to coordinate the installation of both of these things so that we don't create a situation where people are just trying to see how fast they can go, oh. that the speed bumps will be done at the same time. And that's one of the reasons that this is coming forward as a uh, uh, first and final is because we want to make sure that these two things are done at the same time. And I will add that the speed bumps are going to be installed, I believe, this Friday. Yeah. Right. And this equipment is available and could be installed um, very quickly, so we anticipate, if not by the start of the school year, very shortly thereafter. That's the other reason it's coming forward as a first and final. Okay. Great. Um, any questions? Do we, do we need to make a motion on the item before we start asking questions or no? Sure, we do. Mr. President, I'd like to move that we consider approval of a resolution to purchase radar speed sign speed warning signs for PSAP campus. First and final reading, action item 240804. Second. Okay. Questions? I have one. So, and then this also said that there's um, cameras that will collect data. I'm concerned about that. What kind of data and who's getting that data? And what are we doing with it? Yeah. So I think it's actually the way that they described it is the um, the data that is um, so they rank if this person went 70 miles per hour it's not seeing the person it's the data itself that says this triggered at 70 miles this was 65 this is that's the way he explained it yeah. that day I don't think that he, uh, there was not a discussion of a camera no. there I think it was a discussion a, a data collection data so collection. they can download and I do yeah. see that it says camera here so I do these think cameras it's also come with a I data know. collection system. S so, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. th they're speed cameras yeah. is what it is. So it's not actually a visual camera. It's not recording the license plate or the vehicle itself. It's recording the data around the process. So the way that they actually measure the speed is from a radar camera. And so that's the, the device itself. There's not visual pictures that are there. They can, so they can download the data from the sign by going actually to the physical sign. They can download the data and they get the speeds at specific times but they don't get any of the specific vehicles that were there. It is only what speed happened at what times, so they can identify that as an opportunity for additional enforcement um, or monitoring that they may need to do as part of the process. Mm -hmm. So then, so they, so, so they collect this data and they decide at this certain time there's a lot of people speeding. What, then what happens? We could, we could work with Canton Township Police to uh, provide tra traffic enforcement mm -hmm. and ticket. Proactively, not, Proactively, react yeah, not, not reactively. So it would, be, it would be, hey, we're seeing a problem at 6.30 6 p.m. on Wednesdays that this is uh, a, a, a problem happening there. We could bring in additional enforcement to address that situation. It would not be retroactive 
based upon specific vehicles or anything as part of that process. Because it's the data that's collected from the sign is only the speed and the time that that occurred, not what it was. And will, would that be then that information disseminated out to families? Because I can, so that they understand what exactly is right. being collected and what's happening with that data. Right. I think that's a good point. Yeah. Well, it's not identifiable to anybody. Particular, yeah. it's, it's very similar it, to the ones that we, we uh, borrowed from Canton Township uh, Public Safety where we we did a uh, study, it was out there for several weeks, and we clocked ranges between uh, as high as up to 79 miles an hour down the Plymouth Road driveway. So um, it's just a matter of, it's a data collection tool um, to kind of give us an idea of where, you know, what, tra what traffic speeds are and when, when they're occurring. But I think to remember McCoy's point, I'm, I'm wondering if this is what you're asking, and I've that wondering as well. So you're seeing this, you're looking at the data, it's showing a certain time frames, you've got this excessive speeding, uh, there's a need to call in additional support. Would it be helpful to notify families, students and families of PSEP to say, hey, based on the data we've collected, we're gonna have additional support from Canton Township. So they're not saying, all of a sudden we're seeing additional police officers. Absolutely. Is that what you were getting? Well, yeah, and just so that families understand, cause, because when it said cameras, it, to it, me, that triggered the question of, is this like a traffic control camera that snaps your license yeah. plate? No. Well, because without that context, you're not really sure. No, I, and I think that that's important that we communicate these are, you know, just like you see that uh, speed will be con uh, radar controlled. Um, you see those signs coming into communities. Mm -hmm. It's not actually radar controlled. It's measured through radar as part of that process. So I think we need to articulate this as part of our uh, communication to the PSEP families as to what these are and how they're working and more importantly the reason there and the the safety that is is part of this I mean this is the investment that the district is making in safety and security uh, for our students all right any other questions no I was just gonna comment and I, d I don't know why there would be harm if somebody was speeding that they did get ticketed and maybe that would stop it I mean I think that would be a good thing all right any other questions all right. Uh, Just, I wholeheartedly support this, having been around P7 okay. <laughs> yeah. all right, all at in certain favor. times. All in favor say yes. 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 Any yes. opposed say no. All right, motion passes 7-0. All right, that conducts that business. On to citizens' comments, and we have uh, Steve. I'm sorry, what was that? Did I miss something? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, uh, Steve Jenna. Gentilia. There we have it. Uh, just a reminder, you have three minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you, board, for your time. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about the recent decision to eliminate the Chiefs as a Canton High School mascot. In my opinion, this is the wrong decision and a waste of residents' money. Why were students in graphic design class asked to go around and take down all the Chief references in the month of March? The cost to rebrand the school and all of its athletic teams, club teams, will cost much more than you realize. Did anyone look into what it would cost to do this? I don't think you did. If we have that much money laying around, maybe we should think about eliminate, eliminating pay to participate fees <clears throat> and all the other fees associated with athletics in this district, like some of the other districts in the area are starting to do. <clears throat> Or on better thought, like your survey showed, give our teachers a raise. They haven't received one in years. Or bring back in-house grounds and custodial positions that would actually care about what our schools and grounds look like. <clears throat> like my old wrestling coach, Phil Freeman, once told me, just because you made a bad move doesn't mean you can't escape it. I encourage you to rethink this decision and do what's right for the kids in this district. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Uh, that's the only citizens' comments. Uh, we will go. There, there is a sign-up sheet. Um, what's that? And it's on the agenda um, in terms of the policy. Yeah. Um, I'm fine if you want to. 
Did you want to speak? I do, but I guess I need to be educated on the okay. right way to do it. Yeah, I'm sorry. So um, so traditionally what we'll do is uh, you have to uh, basically sign up, turn in one of these forms before the meeting actually starts, put it in the basket, and then and then ultimately they'll bring them, bring them up. So, uh, and then I'll call on you. So would love for you to come back next meeting. And she sat through the whole meeting, did she? Sure, come on up. Um, yeah, uh, but come up to, but the, come up to the mic, please. And then also you'll have uh, three minutes to, to speak. And, and, okay. and state your name for the record. Thank you. My Thank name you. is Amber Spooler. Um, I have both a child in elementary and in high school. Um, I actually just probably could send an email that might be more effective. Okay. But um, I have a lot of questions in regards to bond money for athletics at the high school level and was hoping to get more educated in regards to where the money is slotted and where the softball field at Canton in particular could be um, maybe moved up on that list of items that need to be addressed. Okay. So, so if you want to send an email to Dr. Merritt, um, then she can get you the information and point you uh, in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, and if you could fill that out just so we have a, a record, course. that would yep. be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, on to discussion, MASB Delegate Assembly. So in uh, this week's board notes, I gave you a notification that the MASB's 2023 Delegate Assembly will begin on Thursday, November the 9th. This is at 7 p.m. This will be in Lansing at the Lansing Center. You have a process here as a board to select um, delegates and alternatives. I believe that Trustee Sadu and Trustee Chastang were your representatives last school year. Um, with this, uh, as a part of this process, across the state, members of the Board of Education are going to help to, to decide MASB's positions on a wide variety of issues affecting education. So you have to select your delegates um, and your voting al alternates to represent this Board of Education. And we need to do this, I believe, by uh, all have to be certified by Friday, October the 27th. So we would like to have you vote at the next board meeting, which is actually three weeks away for August. It's going to be on August the 29th. So I suggested that you think about this, take a look at this. And if you would be interested in representing this Board of Education as the voting delegate and alternate to voice your support right here. And I'm sorry, the, the date was... Um December 9th, is that what you November said? November 9th, November. 7 no. p.m. Okay, November 9th. <laughs> you want to tell a little bit about Yeah, this? tell yeah. them how exciting it is. It is actually very exciting. It is. So the uh, Michigan Association of School Boards uh, has a delegate assembly every year to look at membership and find out where they stand on a wide variety of uh, issues, as well as our governance documents. I actually sit on the Michigan Association of School Boards, and so I get to get uh, the in-depth monthly or bi-monthly uh, meetings, as well as look at the, the pamphlet that goes out to all board members to say this is what's being discussed at the delegate assembly. And then there are certain changes that are introduced. Those changes are sent to all board members ahead of time. And then the delegate assembly, everybody votes on those. So you represent, you'll send representation from this board. We get up to four delegates because of the size of our district and all four members have voting rights. So um, it goes pretty, I mean, you're thinking about, you're looking at thousands of people coming into a room and it goes really fast. So you have to have that 100, 200 page document read in advance and make sure that you have talked to um, your colleagues. And every year when you look at that, you send me um, and member Chastening last year, any feedback that you have saying, you know, this is an area of concern. So you bring that up. Um, but it's pretty standard procedure in terms of some language cleanup. It's a lot like policy committee at the state level. So does it help? Yeah. And just for context, for those of you that are on the FNO committee, it is the same night that we have our FNO meeting. So <laughs> we might want to consider either rescheduling that if you have an interest or uh, something like that, because I, I don't know if you could handle yeah, no one would ever that much, too much excitement no, in no, one I night. Plus, <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to be here and then go to Lansing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So if, is if it just the one night? or is It, it is weekend? one night. It goes, um, you're looking at, like I said, hundreds of pages within an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Basically, everything is introduced. All in favor, say aye. Any opposed, nay. You know, motion carries with a large majority. Very little discussion unless there's a huge uproar for something really scandalous. But 
Um, the it's next the next couple days <laughs> after that though is the MASB at conference. Conference. So yeah, generally so, you go up so if you're going to go to the conference. So you can go up like Thursday and then stay and go Friday to things also. Thank you for pointing that out. Right. I you don't have to. You can go up and then go home. Sure. But I think it's in Traverse City this year too. It's in Lansing. Oh, is it Lansing? Okay. So member Western. Oh, you said that. <laughs> yeah. Once once we uh, vote for you, then we'll give you all the details. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I seriously couldn't hear you. <laughs> no, <laughs> once we vote for you, then we'll send all the details and directions and all of that. So you'll be good. All right. <laughs> I do have a question. Do we typically get four delegates? Is that no. consistent every We've year? We've gotten or is that anywhere from one to two. Okay. Two is the max I've seen. Yeah. I've been going for the last four years, I think. Yeah. I think I went before that. And so we have four this year. Yeah. No, there's four there's every four year. There's four every year. Oh. It's just we <laughs> typically don't have interest from this board to get to okay. four. I appreciate that clarification. Yeah. Up to so four. We, we, up we to can four. elect up to four right. folks. But because you have to go, one you have to two. physically go up there. Right. And so, you know, to be at seven o'clock right you know you're leaving here at 5 30. got it great thank you all righty i can feel a lot of interest we're going to get that booked up next so time <laughs> maybe if thinking about it give us an indication because then we'd have this on the 29th that yes. we put for some names yep. it'd be good to know that Send we an email some. to you president wilson yes thank you okay. please all righty uh follow-up board questions I, I have a question. Sure. Um, oh, well, I'm sorry. Real quick. So this is, we didn't have any follow-up board questions from last time, right? That's right. So okay. This would be yeah, I, yeah. Well, during the week, I had I had noticed uh, um, what I considered like a, a pride flag at Bird School in the front, and I didn't know if there was a policy for that or not. I know uh, Dr. Merritt had responded that it was a art thing, but because it's not a vertical flag, but doing my research, I found that 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 is also displayed vertically. You know, you can purchase anything like purchase. I did have heard some concerns about it. Like, what is that out in the front? Um, and so I just don't know, like, if that's something that's going to stay there. Is there a policy on different um, different um, symbols and things like that? Do we have policy on flags and symbols? And um, you know, is there a policy for that? And 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 was that okayed? Was that approved by the principal? Because as much as people would like to decide what it is, and, and I didn't know if that was a dove or a thunderbird. It's actually a thunderbird. Okay, would, so yeah. if it's a thunderbird, that's another concern because if we're going to get rid of the chiefs and we're going to get rid of the arrowhead, a thunderbird, I doing my research, is a supernatural being from the, in, the Indian tribes. It's not a real bird, and it's um, part of their spiritualness. And so they, um, so I don't know why. The Indian Association might be concerned about that one because that's a mascot. But I just, if we're gonna, um, so do one so to thing. answer your question, so I think the question is one. Uh, what I heard was, is this uh, gonna stay? Is, yeah, well, is the the artwork that's in front is that going to stay? So the answer would be yes because it's it's artwork. It's not a pride flag. And so I think, anybody uh, can put artwork up there then. So as I uh, shared in terms of the PTO and the parents, they did a beautification project at Bird in which they have um, rainbow colors. They're going to have a project with the students like as well. That is okay. And it says it's a rainbow pride flag or That's pride symbol. So again, as, um, okay. the answer to that in terms of uh, the pride flag itself, it has six distinct colors. It, if you look so at the colors that are represented there, so for does example, this one. So but does this please one. let Dr. Merrick finish. Distinct colors. Yes. So for example, distinct. the colors that are on the plaque there. Turquoise is a color, for example, which is not a part of the pride well, flag. It has been. Turquoise is not a part of the pride flag. It is the colors that they have chosen there for the colors of the rainbow. And the kids are going to have a project in which they are able to paint rocks, and they'll add it to their beautification garden. Okay, so if I take the American flag. Well, wait, 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 wait. We're, we're, you asked the question, yes. and then we're giving you an answer. I'm right? trying to or clarify. Dr. Right, I'm clarifying. Right, so the, the, so quest, the question the was, the question was, is this a pride flag? The answer was no, it's no, our project. No, but I'm qual qualifying because in her answer, she said because the pride flag is presented horizontally, not vertical. And this one was vertical, so that does not make it a pride anything. But I'm saying if you have a horizontal American flag and you present it vertical, it still stays and represents that symbolism. 
just like if it's on a plaque and not a flag. But but the answer is it's a art project. Well, so so you can you can continue to but you know this could be you, an art project too, right? But, but it's you still listen, you can continue to hold up different angles. But the the and answer so was the an answer, right? And you which can is, help it's an art continue, project. Our school can continue to hold up different things, but it still is what it is, and that's how people are saying it. And it is not always an agreeable thing, and it presents a statement. And just like we were, like we were told, we presented a statement with the chiefs and the chiefs, and some people are going to be distracted and uncomfortable with that. So, so again, the answer to it's not a statement because it is not a pride flag. But and to so, some people, well, and the chiefs was not a statement either. And so that's either, about an education of what it is, and okay. an answer to what has been created there is. Okay. A, right, a just flat color representation of the rainbow. Just wanted right. to know. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions that we will then answer? No? I don't think there were any from this evening. Okay. Perfect. We are good with that. Um, and well, let me say this, because I'm, I'm a very transparent person. Me too. So when you feel pushback from me, my job as president is to keep the meeting going. Often when you're providing comments, there's no question in there. And what you tend to do is no matter what the topic is, you tend to bend that topic to address pretty much the same issues over and over and over again. So, which is your right. So as with everyone, I give everyone a certain amount of time to, to ask questions or provide comments, but then if they continue to go on too long, I will move it along so that we create room for everyone. And what you'll notice is that part of the, the culture of, of this board is that people will respectfully ask a number of questions or make a comment, and then they'll say, well, I'll, I'll defer my next question or my next comment to allow others to go around. Well, I'm not uh, always clear. That, okay. But you've been on the board long enough to see this in action. But sometimes and so, we don't go around twice. So I didn't. But, but you have that opportunity. If you would say, okay, I'm going to defer the rest of my questions or comments, to let other people okay. do it, then I would be sure to come back around okay, to you to answer that. those questions. So I so I, I intentionally make sure that I give everybody on this board a voice because at the end of the day, you receive the votes, you deserve your voice to be heard, and I will always do that. However, I also reserve the right to move the, the okay. meeting along because this is a business meeting, so we have to keep it going. It's not an open forum for each individual board member to basically give um, unended comments uh, on whatever issues they they wish to raise. If you want something on the agenda, if there is an issue that you have a, a, a problem with within the district, as we've talked about in person, uh, uh, as we've talked about over email, and as I've said before uh, in this forum, the proper process if you want to address something is to get it on the agenda. So you should request, if you have an issue with bathrooms, if you have an issue with flags, if you have an, whatever you have an issue with, the, the appropriate step would be to ask for it to be put on the agenda, not to button hook it into whatever topic we're talking about. And, and then you button hook it in and that's what it feels like you're doing. So that's why you'll see me move the, the meeting along. So I just wanna be transparent. Everyone deserves their voice to be heard, but at the end of the day, this is a business meeting and we will keep the business moving. Well, I just felt that was part of business and I also felt like that topic comes up a lot when we're talking about diversity and representing all kids it comes up quite often because that is something, an area that needs to be dealt with because a lot of, some kids are not being represented. So right. it So request for it to be on the agenda. These. Request well, for it to be on the agenda. But I didn't think I could if I didn't have somebody to second it. That's part of the process. So that's part of, that's part of democracy. That's part of what we, you know, that's know, how public. this is structured is that if you have Sorry, an issue, public. you should uh, talk to your other uh, board members and see if there, someone will second it. That's part of the process. Mm -hmm. So, all right, with that being said, we will officially adjourn the meeting at 9.08 p.m.